You know, I was just sitting here <clears throat> thinking about the, the absolute gift um, I feel like I've been given today, hearing uh, all the stories that have been shared. Uh, there are a few that I know or know variations of, but I've also heard stories today that I had never heard before, and that's always really wonderful. Um, several of the stories that I'm going to tell you this afternoon uh, come out of the Abenaki, Wabanaki traditions. So I'm going to speak just a little bit about the Abenaki, Wabanaki peoples um, before I tell you those stories. First of all, I think it's really important to know because I live here in New Hampshire and there is a myth that is not based in truth that there, I've heard some people say there are no Native American people in New Hampshire anymore. And that's really not true. <laughs> so I'm going to just speak to that right now. If anybody wants to know more about that, email me and I'll be happy to, to hook you up with some people who can help educate you um, and let you know more about that. But the Abenaki people, first of all, the traditional lands of the Abenaki, Wabanaki peoples um, include what we think of today. If you look at your mental map of uh, most of a strip of northern Massachusetts, north of what we refer to as uh, Route 2, or was called the Mohawk Trail, almost over the coast. And then all of Vermont, all of New Hampshire, all of Maine. Uh, southeastern Canada, uh, from the Ke south bank of the Quebec down toward the east to the maritime provinces, including Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. All of that is Wabanaki or Abenaki territory. And those two words that sound different to our ears really are the same word. They mean the people of the Dawnland or the people from the east or the place where the sun rises, um, which is actually where we got the name of for this um this festival so long ago, and it's also why we're using that name, the people of the Dawnland for the exhibit at Strawberry Bank. Um, but it's not the name that, that, that Abenaki call themselves. It's what other people used to refer to Abenaki or Wabanaki peoples. You know, those people who live over there where the sun comes up. The Abenaki people themselves call uh, the, use the word Alnoba, and it means the people or the human beings. Um, so just to give a sense of where we are and who we are and that we're still here for 12,000 plus years and counting um, up to the present day. Um, so this, I want to tell you a, a, a story about a being we've heard earlier today uh, from, you know, I wrote it down. Let me see. I think it was uh, Darlene told a Guzgabi story, and that was wonderful. Um, and I'm going to share a Gustavi story with you. I'm going to actually share a, 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 who he is and then one of his stories. Um, Gustavi was not um, human, the two-legged, such as you and I, and also not Double Doc, the owner-creator. Um, somewhere in between, it said that, uh, well, first of all, you might also hear different names for Gustavi. You might hear uh, Gustavi, Gluskap, Kaluskap. Uh, Klaus Gerbe, um, if you get over to Vermont, sometimes he's referred to as Ogioso as well, because that means he shaped himself. And our relatives who live even further to the west, out by the Great Lakes, the Anishinaabe people, the Ojibwe, Chippewa, you'll hear him referred to as uh, Nanabozo or Manabozo. Uh, it's the same being. And the stories, the things that he did and the stories about him are just so wonderful. They travel, you know, they traveled from place to place. They traveled on trade routes and canoeing routes, you know, came to the midsummer gatherings and the midwinter gatherings when people were gathered together with their relations and the younger ones hoping to meet, you know, maybe who would be their life partner. And people share stories. It's what we do. It's what human beings do now, you know, when we get together uh, with, for family meals and or a company comes to visit, you, you share stories. So stories of, of Guskabi are many, I'm sure in the hundreds, if not more. And um, so how Guskabi came to be, it said, is that when Creator had just made this beautiful creation that we get to live in and enjoy and was dusting off the dust that was left over from making creation, that dust hit the ground and started to swirl and shape itself and it shaped a head, and it shaped a torso. And the creator looked down and said, you're wonderful. Who are you? 
And and this being looked up at Creator and said, "Oh, I'm I'm Glascabi. I'm Ogioso. He who shaped himself. Let's go for a walk together. Let's enjoy this beautiful creation." Well, Creator didn't point out that Glascabi didn't have any arms or legs yet. Figured, you know, he could, he could work that out. So Glascabi is trying to get up and realized he couldn't get up off the ground, and so he shaped some arms for himself. And he was pushing and pushing and he pushed so hard to try to get up that he pushed huge piles of earth and rock up on one side of him, and huge piles of earth and rock on the other side. And there got to be a great depression in the ground where he was. Well, he finally figured out he needed to also shape legs. And that's when he got up and went with Creator, walking around together, enjoying the beautiful creation. Now, if you hear this story in... Uh, you know, some parts of New Hampshire and, and all throughout Vermont, you might hear that where Glascabi was pushing the earth up so hard on one side and the other, that on one side, that those piles of rock and earth became the Adirondack Mountains. And on the other side, they became the Green Mountains of Vermont. And that huge depression in the middle became Lake Champlain. Um, the first time, I should say, I, I've heard these stories, the, they, that one and the one I'm going to tell uh, next, about Gluskavi many, many times, their favorite, favorite stories here in, in the Northeast. Um, there are, it seems to be, even though there are hundreds, there's maybe a half a dozen or so you hear a lot. Um, one about how Gluskavi, you know, helped the, the people uh, discover maple syrup. Uh, or how to use it properly, or how the wind eagle, how, how he made the wind eagle stop blowing the wind and then learned a lesson from it. Um, there are quite a few. Um, but I will say the, the very first time I heard this story well over 30 years ago, um, I had the, the, the pleasure and the joy of hearing Joseph Bruchak tell this story at one of the very first story gatherings I ever went to. And I, I look to him and his family now, a family of storytellers, um, with gratitude for what they have done uh, to try to uh, preserve and pass on stories from actually from many traditions, but especially from the Abenaki, Wabanaki traditions. Um, so just, I think it's important to, to acknowledge where we learn stories from. Um, I also, you know, it's why we're dedicating this day to um, Wolf Song because he was, you know, he was about my age. You know, I, I feel very fortunate um, to have known him, met him a couple of times actually at storytelling festivals and just been in awe of his joy of life that came through when, when he told the stories. So we owe much to our storytellers that come before. Now, this next story I want to tell, um, it's Luscabi's story, somehow has become one of my favorites. Um, because Luscabi shaped himself, it's, it's said that um, he didn't have a mother or a father to teach him the things that he needed to know to live well on the earth. Um, and so Creator gave him a grandmother, and she was going to teach him things that he needed to know, guide his growing. And so he lived with his grandmother, Woodchuck. And one day, uh, he went into the lodge where he lived with his grandmother. And he said, Grandmother, it's a fine day. I'm going to go, I'm going to go hunting today. You know, and he was still pretty young then. Uh, and so grandmother looked up and she had all of her supplies all around about her. And she said, well, oh, grandson. Good idea. You go hunting. I have a lot of things I have to do today. But she had things around her she needed to mend and things she needed to make. And well, she thought, well, if he goes hunting, that'll keep him busy. So he took his quiver of arrows and his bow and he left their lodge and he started going across the clearing towards the woodlands. But he was a very young hunter and he made a lot of noise on his way out to the woodlands. So the animal people and the bird people heard him coming. They knew his hunting. They could see his weapons, so they hid. Well, Wisconsin got out into the woodlands, and he looked all morning, and he could not find one animal creature, not one bird person, no one to hunt. And he finally got very deep into the woods, and he started to hear a sound. And then he realized it was laughter. And the bird and the animal people knew he was hunting, and he couldn't find them, and they were laughing at him. Well... 
he had to do something. So he turned around and he went back through the woodlands and back across that clearing to the lodge where he lived with grandmother Woodchuck. And there was a stick across the doorway saying she was busy in there. She didn't want to be disturbed, but he just knocked the stick to one side. He went stomping on into their lodge. Grandmother, grandmother, I've been hunting all morning. The bird people and the animal people, they're laughing at me. They know I'm hunting. I need help. Grandmother looked up. What do you need? Well, grandson, what do you think you need? And he thought for just a minute. He said, I need a game bag, grandmother. I need a game bag. That will, that will help. She said, a game bag? Yes, grandmother. Absolutely. I need a game bag. Make a game bag for me. Uh-huh. Well. She knew he wasn't going to go away because he's going to ask and beg and plead and wheedle until she, you know, did it. So she looked around. She found a big hunk of elk hair and she twined it out and she wove it. She got a good sized piece of fabric and she folded it over and she bound it off and she put a strong carrying strap on it and she gave it to Gluskabi and he took it. Ah, oh, grandmother. Oh, this is a fine game bag. Look how well it's woven. Oh, yeah. And then he threw it on the floor of their lodge. But it's not what I had in mind. Make another one for me, grandmother. She looked at him. Grandson, what do you want? He said, I don't know, but that one's not quite right. Make another one for me, grandmother. So she looked around in her supplies. She found a big hunk of moose hair and she twined it out and she moved it. And she folded it over. She bound off the edges. She put a strong carrying strap on it. It was even more tightly woven than the first one. She gave it to her grandson and Gluskabi took it. Ah, oh, grandmother, this is a wonderful, fine, very well-made game bag. And then he threw it on the floor of the lodge. Still not what I had in mind. Make another one for me. Grandson, what do you want? I've made two game bags for you. You, you you need to tell me, what do you want? Well, he thought about it for just a minute. And he said, hmm, I think it should be made of woodchuck fur. Oh, grandson, I understand. And she started to pull the soft fur from her very own belly till she had a little pile of woodchuck fluff. And she twined it out and she wove it and she folded it over and bound it off, put a carrying strap on it. It was very small. Oh, hey. Oh, she looked around. She she took some porcupine quills. She thought maybe if she decorated it, he would notice how small it was. So she softened them and flattened them in her teeth for quite a while until she had woven embroidered a beautiful design on one side of the bag. And then she took the bag and she gave it to Scabby, and he took it, and he looked at it. Oh, grand's grandmother. Mm. Yes, this is exactly what I needed. Olioni, thank you, grandmother. And he took the bag, and he tied it on his belt. He picked up his quiver of arrows and his bow, and he left the lodge. And he, he got about halfway across that clearing towards the woods when he remembered that the bird and animal people knew he was hunting. And, well, he was going to have to come up with something to trick them. And he got an idea. So he went into the woods and he went in deep until he came to the very place where he had heard the bird and animal people laughing. And he started to cry. Oh, oh it's terrible news. Oh, it's terrible. I'm so sorry for my friends. The, the bird people and the animal people the world is ending i don't know oh it's just so sad well they heard him they were hiding but they heard him and they started telling each other do you hear that the world is ending well that news passed through the woodlands from one creature to another they forgot to be afraid of Gluskabi. they knew he had power they came rushing out from their hiding places Gluskabi, did you hear the the world is ending you have to help us you have to help save us. You, you, you must be our friend. You have to help. And Gluskabi said, well, maybe there's something I can do. I just happen to have a game bag here, you know, and it's small. I, I know it doesn't look like much, but it's special. It has power. 
So I'll put it on the ground and open it up. And all you need to do is get into the bag. And when you're all in there, I'll cinch it up and I'll hold it. And I will keep you safe when the world ends. What do you think? Oh, they thought that was a wonderful idea. So we put the game bag down on the ground, open it up and step back. Sure enough, the snake crawly creatures slithered in and rabbits hopped in and deer bound in and bear lumbered in and birds flew in. And pretty soon, every living creature in the woodlands was in Gluskabi's bag. And he looked around to be sure. And he cinched it up, hefted it onto his shoulder and said, "Uh aha, supper time. So we went back through the woodlands, across the clearing to the lodge where we lived with Grandmother Woodchuck. And that stick was back across the door saying she was busy in there. She didn't want to be disturbed, but he just knocked the stick to one side and went right into their lodge. Grandmother, look at this. You won't believe this. Look, 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 look. And he put the bag down on the floor right in front of her. And she could see like knobby things moving around inside of it. And he opened up the bag and he said, look, look, grandmother. And she looked into the bag and there were many, many, many pairs of eyes looking out at her. She looked up at Higuskabi, grandson, what have you done now? <laughs> and he told her, <laughs> he told her how he had tricked all the bird people, all the animal people into getting into his bag. And grandmother, from now on, I'll never have to hunt again. We get hungry. I just got to reach in and grab somebody and cook them. I'll never have to hunt again. And grandmother looked at Glasgabi and she looked at the bag and she looked back at her grandson and said, "Uh uh-huh, you got them all? Oh, yeah, grandmother, I got them, every single one. You didn't miss any of them. No, 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 they're there. They're right in the bag, grandmother. Uh Uh-huh. So grandson, if you have all the bird people and animal people in your bag and there are none left out in the woodlands, After we get finished eating all these, and there are none left, well, what are your children going to eat? What are you, someday, what are your children's children going to eat? Well, he just thought about that for a moment or two, and then he knew exactly what she was telling him. Oh, 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 grandmother. Well, he cinched up the bag, and he hefted it up on his shoulder, and he went trudging out of their lodge went halfway through that clearing. And then, well, he remembered that he had tricked the bird and animal people and he didn't want them to know that. So he had to come up with another idea and he did. So he went into the woods to the very place where he had tricked the bird and animal people into getting in his bag. He put it down on the ground, carefully opened it, stepped back. It's all right, it's safe, you can come out now. The world ended, but I put it back together. Come on, you can come out. So the birds came out, flew out, bear lumbered out, and the deer bound out, rabbits hopped out, the snakes and all the slithery creatures came out, and they all went to their homes and looked. Oh, Guscave, nice job. Oh, you did such good work putting everything back together again. But then they looked really closely, and when they did, they realized nothing had changed since earlier in the day. And that's when they knew Uzgabi had tricked them. So they say that's why it is this very day that if a hunter goes out into the woods to even a place where no human being has ever gone before and takes their game bag off the belt and puts it down on the ground, opens it up and steps back, not one creature in the entire woodlands is going to get into that bag. Because they remember what happened so long ago when Gluskade tricked them. And that's the end of that story. And that's how it goes. Oh, hey. Hey. I don't know if anybody else has seasonal allergies going, but I do. So forgive the fantastic Kleenex. (laughs) I see you, ears grow. (laughs) Okay. Um, This this next story is kind of new to me. Um, but I think the reason why I like it will become clear in a few. I, uh, this comes from so long ago, as many many of our stories do. It's before the human beings were here. 
and the animal people were much bigger than they are today. And it was hot. It was in the middle of summer. And the day was so hot. And Moose, who was as tall as the white pine trees, was thirsty. And he walked for a long time till he came to a wide, long river. It was deep and it. The water looked cold and he just plunged his whole muzzle into the water and he started drinking and drinking and drinking while well, he was huge. So he was taking in huge gulps of the river. And as he did, the water level started to drop. And the fish persons, fish people who were living in the water, they got nervous. And they, they decided to, they have to try to scare him away. So they went, swam around his feet and they were nibbling at his ankles. But he just kind of kicked them off. So fish went flying and he ignored them. And he kept drinking and drinking and drinking. And the water level was getting lower and lower. The beaver people noticed because they made their lodges in the river and everything that they counted on for survival was right around and about that area where they could close things off and make little ponds for themselves. Well, they looked at this moose and they thought, hmm, you know, beaver people have those teeth in front that make them really good at being able to cut trees down. And that moose was so tall. His legs were so long. They looked like four trees. So the beaver people swam out into the river and they took their teeth and started gnawing away at the ankles and the, and the legs of the moose, but he just kicked them and the beaver people went flying. Well, pretty soon everybody was getting nervous because moose just kept drinking and drinking and drinking. They were trying to decide what they could do about it when a cloud of black flies came buzzing by and wanted to know what was going on. And they told him, well, they told him, look, look, look what that moose is doing. He's, he's, been, he's dropped the level in the river by half, and he hasn't been here that long. We need help. We need him to stop drinking. Well, the black fly people said, hmm, okay, we got this. So they went swarming around that moose, and they bit all his soft places. They bit behind his ears and in his ears and his nostrils. They bit behind his legs and the backside of him. They bit everywhere at every single bite. Dung. Oh, Moose was on fire and he started stomping everywhere and he couldn't kick them the way he had kicked the fish people, kicked the, the beaver people. They were too small. They would just, you know, keep flying away. And he was kicking and stomping and kicking and stomping and they were biting and biting and biting and biting. And every time he kicked and stomped, he was kicking up rocks from the bed of the river and they were starting to pile up and the rocks were starting to cause the water to rush over so that the river wasn't even smooth and calm anymore. It looked like white water. And he kicked and he kicked and he kicked and he kicked until finally he gave up. And he went running away because he had to try to get, but that cloud of black flies just chased him right away from the river. Now, when the beaver people and the fish people and the other animals looked at what had happened in the river, they could see water tumbling over rocks. They could even see a place where there was a huge drop from one level of the river down to another. So the fish people had to practically jump to get from the top of the river down. And they say that's how it is that we came to have the Amoskeg Falls, the good fishing place in the Merrimack River. And that's the end of that story. And that's how it goes. For those of you who aren't in Manchester, it's in, in New Hampshire that the falls are in Manchester, New Hampshire. I don't know where we have people coming from today, hopefully from all over the place. So still working on that one, but I like that. I really like that story, I like that visual image of, of the moose uh, getting retribution from the black flies. You know, I hate black flies, just myself personally. Does anybody really love black flies? I can identify with moose in that story. Um, I was going to tell the doll with no face. And I think it's interesting, you know, that we've only had a couple of like near, um, uh, I don't want to say near misses or whatever, but near instances of us sharing the same stories today. But um, I, I think that um, Deborah did a good job with that one. So I'm, I'm going to give kudos to you and um, I will tell that one another time. And I'm going to move on to a story. I actually, I actually found this book. I don't really remember how I came across it, but it's a book by a woman named C.J. Taylor. 
and she lives in Quebec. Uh, she's of Mohawk. Her father was Mohawk. I think her mother's German ancestry. Um, and she lives near Kahnawaka um, Reservation. And she is an artist and she is also um, an author, storyteller. And what was interesting to me was this book that I came across, it actually combined about two or three stories that I tell, um, Abenaki stories. Um, but I, I really liked the way she did it. And so um, instead of telling three different stories, I'm going to tell you this interesting version um, of some of the origins of things um, that the Abenaki people talk about and teach about. It had been a long winter, and the people had broken up into hunting groups at the beginning of the winter to go off to make their winter camps, and they didn't see other family groups for a long time. They wouldn't until they came together again in the spring. And Two Feather had been off by himself hunting for most of the winter. It had been a long time since he'd seen any people because he had gone off on his own. He's a young man. And so he was really lonely. He was hoping to see some, some other human faces pretty soon. You know, the snow was starting to melt. Um, he'd gotten pretty hungry, you know, other than the meat he'd been able to uh, hunt. He was kind of eating the inner bark for some trees and digging down under the snow to see what he could find there to eat. But it was kind of a warm day and the snow was melting. And he came to a place where there's a very slow moving stream and mossy banks. And he sat down to get a drink of water. And he could see his own reflection in the water that reminded him when he saw his face how long it had been since he'd seen any other faces. And he was feeling sad, you know. So after he got a drink of water, he just laid down for a while. You know, sometimes we do that when we're sad, we just kind of curl up. <laughs> Think maybe the sadness will go away if we ignore it for a while. Well, he was kind of dozing there in the sunlight on the moss when he heard someone call his name, Two Feathers. And he looked, he looked around and he saw a beautiful woman. Ah, <gasps> whoa, a beautiful woman. He fell in love right in that instant. And he asked, who are you? She said, no, don't, don't. just come with me. Come with me. And he tried to reach out to her. She said, no, no, don't touch. Just come with me. Come with me, Two Feather. Well, he followed her. He followed her all day long. And he kept trying to reach toward her and catch up with her and touch her. But she was always just a little bit ahead of him. And it almost seemed like her feet didn't quite touch the earth. She was maybe so graceful that she was moving on ahead and never got out of his sight, but never got close enough for him to touch. And they went on like that all day long till he was tired. You know, every time he needed to stop and, and have something to eat or get a drink of water, she, she'd pause and then she let him on, but it was finally getting really dark. And so she stopped and he settled down for the night well, he even took out his flute. He was playing beautiful songs for her, hoping to win her heart that way. That didn't happen. <laughs> but the next morning, she was still there. And when he got up, he followed her again. And this went on for quite a few days. They went over mountains. They went through valleys. They finally came to a place where there was a huge meadow with just, you know, trees around the edges and those kind of wetlands you can find at the edges of meadows. And she stopped and she told to Feather to gather together some of the dried grasses that were there and build them up into a pile. So he did. And she told him how to take a couple of sticks and how to work them until there was a spark. And that startled him. He'd never seen that before. And it hit the grass and it started to burn. And the grasses burned quickly. And it started to spread, and he was afraid. <laughs> he had never seen fire before. She said, it will be all right. Don't worry. It will be all right, Two Feather. Well, that fire spread and spread and spread throughout the whole meadow till it finally got to those damp places around the edges, and it burned out. And all the ground was black. And then she said, I have a gift for you. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to gather up my hair and I want you to take my hair, 
and don't look, just take my hair and drag me behind you back and forth and back and forth over the field. He said, I don't want to do that. I'll hurt you. I don't want to hurt you. I, I don't want to hurt you. And she said, shh, shh, it will be all right, Two Feather. Just please do what I ask. So he took her hair and he turned his back to her again. He didn't stand to think about how this would hurt. And he did. He dragged her back and forth and back and forth across the field, working himself from side to side and from one end of the field to the other. And as he walked, somehow it seemed like where he was pulling her, it weighed less and less and less until finally he reached the far side of the field and he really couldn't feel any weight to her at all. And he looked at his hand and all he had was some golden hair. And he looked around him, she was gone. She disappeared. He didn't know what to think. He sat there for a while, kind of looking around to see what had happened. And he looked back across the field and there were green sprouts coming up in the meadow in every place that he had walked back and forth, dragging this woman behind him. Well, he made camp and he stayed there. He was curious about what had happened. He missed her. He didn't understand what these green things were. And he thought, well, I'll just stay here for a while. There was a river, so there was water. And there was game to be able to hunt. Well, he stayed there so long, these plants, they grew and they grew and they grew. And pretty soon other of his people started to come together, coming back from their winter camps. And they found him. He had a fire going. They'd never seen that before. Well, they set up their lodges and they created a village. And so he wasn't lonely anymore. And the people realized when the plants finally stopped growing that they had these interesting things that they called ears, you know, cobs of corn, corn. It was corn that was growing. Oh, it was so wonderful to have this food. And the corn spirit, the corn mother, had given it as a gift to, to Feather and his people. So from that time on, the people had a steady food supply. And every year they saved some of that corn to be able to plant again the next year. And the years passed by and Two Feather married and he had children. But every year when the green corn season came, when the corn was ripened and they were picking those first ears of corn, he would always stop and tell his children this story about the corn mother who gave herself for the al Naba for the human beings. And when he touched the corn silk, he was always reminded of her, of her hair and of her gift. So this story tells how we came to have fire, how we came to have corn, and how we came to on the back to have community. And that's the end of that story. And that's how it goes. Oh, hey. I'm just checking to see what I'm doing for time. Okay. Um, all right. Scubby baby, coming from Scubby. I'm checking my little list here, trying to decide which ones. I make a huge list of stories, and then I decide, hmm, I think about now, <laughs> which ones I feel like telling on any given day. Um, Deborah had mentioned strawberries earlier. And um, and here's Co had mentioned the Salagi, the Cherokee people. Um, so let's put those two ideas, planted thoughts in my head, and I think I'm going to tell a story. And actually, this is one I, I, I had found, I gosh, maybe it was in a collection of stories, might have been in, in Mooney's uh, books, the, the collection of the, of the um, stories and myths of the Cherokee. But I do know also there was a children's book that was published um, uh, by Joseph Bruchak. I don't remember who did the illustrations. They were beautiful. But it's just called, they called the book, The First Strawberries. But I'll tell you the story. Saying a long time ago, first woman and first man were living together. They had a new lodge that they built together. They were learning how to work together as a couple, as a team, 
how to get to know one another because everything was new and they were new to each other. But they came up with ways that, that each one of them played to their strengths. So, you know, the first man, he was good at fishing and making tools. He was good at hunting. He had nice strong shoulders and back. So those were some of the things that he tended to do. And first woman, she loved to go out and see what was what new things were growing. And, and she liked to experiment with the herbs she found and the plants she found and and how to find ways to to feed them, to help them feel better if maybe they weren't feeling well, and even how to cook so she could feed them well, good, nutritious food. So one day, first man said, well, he was going to go out and go hunting. And first woman said, oh, that's good. I'll, I'll have a nice meal. So I'll have some soup ready when you come back. So first man left to go hunting and first woman went out of the lodge to forage around, see what she could find for a base for her soup. And she saw something she had not really seen before. She saw beautiful colors, things, small things with beautiful colors everywhere. And she, she went up to them and she looked at them and all oh, the colors were so different. And each one had its own scent. Oh, they smelled wonderful. And she started picking them. They were the first flowers. And she gathered arms full of them. She said, oh, first man would love these. They are so pretty and they smell so good. And she spent all morning collecting many, many, many stems of these flowers and putting them in their house to make their house beautiful and to smell good. Filled every kind of container she could possibly find. She set them around on their benches and put them in the walls. She said, first man's going to like this when he comes home. She completely forgot about making a meal because she was so amazed and just astounded by the color and the scent of these flowers. It took her entire focus for the day. And the sun was starting to set and first man came home from hunting. And as he came into the lodge, he looked around, he saw her and he said, oh, I'm hungry. And she looked at him and she said, no, 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 look, 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 look. I, did, I, I wanted you to see these. Don't you notice something different? And well, he looked and he said, oh, yeah, pretty. I'm hungry. But it was, was something to eat. I thought you were going to have some food. Well, she couldn't believe it, that he couldn't even stop for a few moments and smell some of these pretty flowers. But he didn't even notice what she had done to try to make their, their lodge more beautiful for them. She got angry. She didn't understand why he couldn't take a moment, why he couldn't understand. She had to think about it especially because she was upset. And so she left their lodge and she just turned her back on it and started walking toward the sunset. And she was so preoccupied, so upset, and, you know, kind of angry that she was looking just right down at the ground. She wasn't seeing anything around her. She's just walking, walking, walking. Well, it finally got to be really late and first man started to get worried. She hadn't come back. He thought she'd come back, but she, she hadn't. So he started to follow her. And that's when he realized there was a problem because she had been walking fast. Then he started practically jogging to try to catch up with her following her trail. Then it got dark. Well, where she was, first woman paused for the night. And where he was way back, first man stopped for the night too. And the next morning as the sun came up, first man realized that he really needed help. So with his morning prayers, when he went to water and was seeking his prayers to creator for the day, he asked for help. Oh, please, I need to just catch up with her, you know, so I can tell her I'm sorry, so we can talk about what happened. And, well, creator felt sympathy for him. It's not easy to learn to live together. So creator looked ahead to where first woman was and shone light down very brightly on the path right next to her. And as it did that, as Creator did that, a bush sprung up, kind of thorns, trailing vines, actually, kind of canes of things. And they had big red berries on them. They were the first raspberries, but she didn't even see them. She didn't even see them. She kept walking by. And so Creator shone light up ahead of her on the other side, and a big bush sprung up. And there were big, beautiful blue berries, the first blueberries. But she was so busy looking just down straight ahead of her at the ground and walking and thinking and so sad. She didn't even notice them. So 
creator finally shone light on the path right in front of her where she couldn't possibly miss it without stepping all over it. And some vines spread and little white flowers grew and then beautiful, big red berries popped out and she stopped. She said, oh, 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 what are those? And she bent down and she picked one of them. It was a big, big, beautiful berry, almost in like the shape of a heart. She smelled it. Oh, it smelled so good. She licked it. it was sweet. It was sweet as sunshine. So she ate it. Oh, first man would like these. She completely forgot she was angry. She picked and picked and picked. She had so many strawberries and she held them in the skirt of her dress. And as she was picking them, finally, first man caught up with her. And she turned around and looked at him and she said, here, try this. And he did. He ate one and it was sweet. And as they ate those berries, the anger in their hearts melted away and they started talking about what had happened and how they had misunderstood one another and what they could do better next time. And they started walking back home to their lodge, talking to each other. And as they did, they passed those bushes with the first blueberries and they picked them too. And as they kept walking, they passed those canes with the first raspberries and picked them as well. And when they got home, they had a wonderful meal with some of these first fruits and talked about how they could do better in the past. Well, They say that's why it is to this very day in a lot of Cherokee homes. You'll see that there are all kinds of things that everything from potholders to art uh, to pieces of jewelry that might have strawberry designs or strawberries and flowers. And it's to remind us that when we see those beautiful heart-shaped berries, to remind us of our own hearts. And when we taste berries, to taste the sweetness of them and remind us that when we're talking to someone that we love, when we're talking at all, that the words that come out of our mouths from our hearts should be sweet because they're going to touch the hearts of those we're talking to. And that's the end of that story. And that's how it goes. Hope, oh, hey. 22. I don't even have my schedule in front of me. Oh, we're done. Fine. Okay. Um, okay, I was just, I was waffling on whether or not to tell you my absolute, totally favorite story in the whole world, but I'm going to. So some of you have heard me tell stories before, um, have heard this story before, um, but it's, I don't know why it, it adopted me years and years and years ago, about 35 years ago, maybe closer to 40, um, I first heard this story from a, 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 a storyteller named Claudia Altimus. And it came to me through her as a Lenny Lenape story. I was told it was a, from the Delaware people, Lenny Lenape people. Um, but it's such a good story. And I've been telling it so long that, that I know other Abenaki storytellers have come to me and asked if they could tell it. And it's become um, a much loved story here in Ndakana in our land, in Abenaki territory as well. So I'm going to share it now. It's said that this story comes, again, from so long ago, so early in the world, that the animal people were much bigger than they are today, and they could talk to each other. And uh, they really were that much bigger. You know, we're talking about the time of mastodons and giant beavers and saber-toothed tigers running around the Northeast a um, long time ago, tens of 10,000 or more years. Well, The animal people could talk to each other. And in this story, one more thing is important to know. It was daylight all the time. Well, Kingfisher was sitting up on the branch of a tree, just enjoying the beautiful day. And across the river on the bank, on the other side, Otter was sunning herself. And suddenly between them and a river, in the river, big fish jumped up out of the water. And at the same moment, Kingfisher swooped down from his side. Otter slithered off the bank and swam from her side. And each one of them grabbed an end of that fish. And neither one of them wanted to give the prize up to the other. So they started to pull. And Kingfisher was flapping his wings and pulling one way. And Otter was swimming for all she was worth and pulling the other way. And then Kingfisher would gain. Then Otter would gain. And neither one of them wanted to give that prize up. And they got angry and they started yelling, hey, that was my fish. No, it was mine. Well, the fish took one look, plopped back in the river and swam away. 
And they were so busy fighting about whether or not it was otter's fish or kingfisher's fish. They didn't even notice. And pretty soon over on Kingfisher's side of the river, all the bird people were yelling that they'd seen the whole thing. And Kingfisher definitely got there first. Then on Otter's side of the river, all the animal people were yelling back, no, 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 no. You do not know what you are talking about. We saw it. Otter got there first. It was her fish. Well, the fighting spread. It spread through the woodlands. It got louder and louder. Nobody even remembered what they were fighting about anymore. But the fighting got louder and louder and louder until Creator noticed. Well, Creator had given the bird and the animal people everything they needed to live well. They had nice fur suits or feather suits. They had plenty to eat. They had good homes. There was nothing for them to be fighting about. Oh, hey. So Creator decided to do something and started to weave. Creator wolf for a long time until there was a huge blanket and took that blanket and spread it across the sky between the sun and the earth. And this pitched the earth into darkness, into absolute total blackness for the first time. Oh, well, the fighting, thank you. The fighting stopped. The bird and animal people were afraid. They'd never seen this before. And in a while, you could hear them start to call out to each other. By the sounds of their voices, they found each other, and they formed a a big council circle, and they sat there in the dark. Now, they weren't afraid anymore because they were together with friends. But they didn't know what they were going to do. And then a while later, a voice spoke up, a strong voice, said, I'm eagle. I have strong wings. I have sharp talons. Why don't I just fly up there and just rip that blanket away? Oh, hey. Hey, So they agreed. And Eagle Sir, up and up for a whole day till he came to that blanket across the sky. And he sank in his talons. He beat his wings and he pulled and he tugged and he beat his wings all day long until he was exhausted and he fell (gasps) down. And down and down and what he landed right in the middle of the circle. And they felt around in the darkness until they found Eagle. Oh, they found him. <sighs> and sat there for a long time, remembering their brother Eagle. Now not knowing what they were going to do. But a while later, another voice spoke up. I am red-tailed hawk. Like my brother, the eagle, I have strong wings and I have sharp talons. He must have loosened the blanket. I'll I'll just fly up there and finish the job, ho. Hey. Hey. So eagle, the red-tailed hawk left and circled up and up for a whole day as eagle had. Till he came to the blanket across the sky and he sank in his talons. He beat his wings and he pulled and he tugged and he beat his wings and pulled and tugged all day long until... He was exhausted and fell down and down and down and whomp. He landed right in the circle. Now this time they knew that sound, not a good sound. And they sat there remembering their brother's eagle, red-tailed hawk, and really not knowing what to do. But finally a voice spoke up out of the darkness and said, I'm bear. I am big. I am strong. I'm one of the strongest in the woodlands, but I can't fly. We need somebody to fly up there and finish the job. Well, no one was offering. Finally, a little while later, a small voice from almost the outside of the circle spoke up. Well, maybe there's something I can do. And the bear looked, who is that? Who is that? I can't see you. And the voice said, well, it's hummingbird. Hummingbird. Bear knew it wasn't polite to laugh, but hummingbird, what what could you do that eagle and red-tailed hawk couldn't do? She said, I don't know, but I'm willing to try. Well, they talked about it in a council circle. Most of them thought it would be a real waste of time. She was so much smaller than eagle and red-tailed hawk. But finally, the bear spoke up again and said, I don't hear anyone else offering. And as I have pointed out, I can't fly. I, I think we should let her go. I think we should let her try it, Ho. And they agreed. Hey, 
And so Hummingbird left and she circled up and up one day, two days, three days. It took her four days just to get to that blanket across the sky. So she had a lot of time to think on the way up. She didn't have the strong talons and wings that her brothers, Eagle and Red-tailed Hawk, Hawk had, but she had an idea. She had her own unique gift. And so she thought while she was flying up there about her long pointed needle-like beak. So she got to the blanket. She hung on with her tiny little claws. She took her beak and poked it right through the blanket and pulled it out. And one single beam of light came through the blanket and down to the earth below. And she was encouraged. So she started flying all around, poking many, 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 many holes in the blanket. And for every hole she poked, a beam of light came through the blanket and down to the earth below. And pretty soon down on the earth, there was this twilight. And the animal and bird people could just almost start to see each other. And they started to sing and drum and oh, make such a joyful noise. Hummingbird heard them. She got inspired. She started flying all over the place. She was poking thousands of holes in that blanket. She even started to do the outlines of different creatures, even a great big bear, because bear had stood up for her in the circle. But she finally got tired, and she circled down one day, two days, three days, four, and she landed right by the bear. And bear looked down at her and said, hummingbird, hummingbird, look, look what you've done. Look up. Look up. And Hummingbird looked up at the sky. Ah, there were so many twinkling lights. It was, it was beautiful. And she'd done it all by herself with just the encouragement of her friends. From that time on, you know, life was going well again. They could see well enough in this new twilight world to find their homes and to find food. Well, some of the new creatures even liked this new twilight world. Owl's eyesight got very sharp for hunting in the dark, and Bat learned how to bounce sound off things to get around. And there were these little peepers that made beautiful songs up about this twilight world. Now, there were those who missed the daylight, but they remembered what happened the last time Creator had noticed them, so they decided to be quiet. And then one day, Creator noticed the quiet noticed the peace on the earth and decided the bird and animal people had learned their lesson and took that blanket away from across the sky. And the sunlight shone down on them. It was so bright, it almost blinded their eyes. But it was warm. Oh, oh it felt so good. But Creator decided that the bird and animal people needed a reminder to not ever fight like that again. And so for half of the day, brings that blanket back across the sky for nighttime and stars. And the other half of the day takes it away again for sunlight and warmth. And that's how we came to have nighttime as well as day and how Hummingbird put the stars in the sky, according to our relations, the Lenape people. Oh, hey. Hey. hey.